very welcome to the third of our webinars in the CAM APS FX series. Today's webinar is a very practical one. Um, we hope you enjoy it. We're going to give you lots of tips and things about how to optimize settings after starting the system. So as I said earlier, please uh, use the chat feature to say hello to everyone and also to ask your questions that we will answer at the end of the session. The webinars are being recorded and they can be viewed on the CAM APS training portal after the event should you want to just go back and look at them again. So please cameras off and everyone on mute. Just as a reminder, sorry, Charlotte, next slide, please. Is that switched for you? There we go, perfect. So uh, the next two webinars we've got planned are uh, around schools training. And the one that follows up is fine tuning again on um, trying to get better time in range if you still need to fine tune. And then we've just sorted out some webinars for the new year around exercise and carbs and meals and a few other bits and pieces that we will be advertising shortly. So do watch out for those. I'd like to now uh, introduce the team. Charlotte and Sarah will be taking you through the formal presentation. Roman isn't with us tonight, but he is the brains behind uh, the CAM APS system. So we definitely need his uh, face in as part of the team. And I'm Candace Ward and I'll be facilitating uh, the webinar. So I'll hand over to Charlotte, thank you. Thanks, Candice. So um, for tonight's webinar, we're looking at sort of how to get the most out of um, the CAM APS FX system and closed loop systems and sort of really looking at optimizing settings. So in the previous ones, we've looked at how it works and a bit of an introduction and really getting started on it. And this is more to sort of look at um, adjusting settings to really get the most out of the technology. So throughout the course of the um, session this evening, we're gonna go through just a very brief reminder of the system for those of you that haven't been able to attend our previous webinars and what the adjustable inputs are that are gonna make a difference to, to closed loop functioning. We'll look at the importance of getting the basics right, uh, some uh, ideas around the differences in management of hypo and hyperglycemia with closed loop systems, the use of ease off and boost and how they can really help improve um, glucose control. And then we'll look at, um, at the end towards um, reviewing closed loop data and how to adjust insulin carbohydrate ratios when you're using a closed loop system and using the personal glucose target. So just by way of a, a reminder, many of you will be familiar with this. This is the CAM APS FX system. So the Android smartphone, which hosts the app, which acts as a, a CGM or glucose sensor receiver and communicates with the uh, DANA RS or DANA R or soon to be DANA I pump. And the data is automatically uploaded to the glucodiacin cloud. So Again, as a, as a reminder, how does this system work? What it does is it modulates insulin delivery by pushing the pump basal rates down to zero units, and then it allows it to adjust an extended bolus every 10 to 12 minutes. And this is really important in terms of understanding why certain settings make a difference with this system and why others don't. What this does mean, though, is that it flashes this no delivery on the screen, which isn't of concern. You can see just above there on the pump screen the um, extended bolus which is being delivered. And if there is a real reason for no delivery, such as an occlusion or um, run out of insulin, then the pump will alarm or vibrate to whichever you've set it to. Because this is hybrid closed loop, just as a reminder, it still requires insulin boluses for carbohydrates, particularly if we're aiming at trying to improve our time in range. So again, just an overview of the CAM APS FX settings. So the things that don't affect the closed loop operation are the active insulin time, the insulin sensitivity, and the pre-programmed basal rates. These are all important, particularly when you're not in, in auto mode, um, because they will influence delivery. But when you're in auto mode, those things don't make a difference. And that's different to other closed loop settings. The adjustable settings, which can be used to sort of optimize outcomes, include the insulin to carbohydrate ratio and the glucose targets. So the default glucose target 
target for this system is 5.8, but we'll talk a little bit later on about how that can be adjusted uh, to, to benefit the user. And so in terms of the inputs to the algorithm, at initialization, what it, what it requires is just the body weight and the total daily insulin dose. And then the algorithm itself is what's responsible for calculating every individual's different insulin sensitivity and active insulin time. And that's why altering those things on your pump isn't going to affect closed loop delivery because that's being calculated behind the scenes. So that's just a little bit about the rationale as to why adjusting those settings isn't going to make a difference with this system. In terms of the ongoing inputs, it requires the real-time glucose data from the CGM device and information about the carbohydrates and prandial insulin boluses. And again, that's why the insulin to carbohydrate ratio needs to be accurate and, and will make a real difference to overall output. What it shows here is you can see in the in the dots when they're open they're above the target range when they're they're filled in black then they're entering the target range um, and which we use as 3.9 to 10 in the non-pregnant uh, population with type 1 diabetes you can see in the thick blue line at the bottom that's the closed loop driven insulin delivery and then you can see at the top the mealtime boluses and the carbohydrates being given in the pink, that's the, the boost, and in the yellow, that's the ease off. And what we're going to go through is all of these different sort of functionalities and how we can use them to get the best outcomes. One of the really helpful ways of doing this, I mentioned earlier that the data automatically uh, uploads to Diasend. It doesn't require sort of plugging in or anything. And that happens whenever the phone is connected to Wi-Fi or if it's got a SIM card in, it can happen all the time. And one of the views that we find particularly useful, Diasend has a huge uh, number of different ways of looking at the data. Um, but particularly for closed loop, we use the day by day, comparison day by day view. And this is just a snapshot of it here. And you can see it really shows sort of um, superimposed on the top graph. You've got the, the glucose values, again, with that target range in the green shaded area. But you can also see what's happening with the closed loop just below and when the manual insulin boluses are being given. So there's a lot of information here and we do tend to use this quite a lot in terms of adjusting settings and sort of really trying to look at patterns and see where, where things can be changed to get better outcomes. So when we talk about time in range, this is um, uh, data from an international consensus which was, uh, which was carried out in, in 2019, and it's really um, changed the way that we think about glucose control and moving away from HbA1c to a slightly more sort of uh, tangible time in range. And it's really important, I think, to discuss the targets because I think there's a lot of um, people that think that if, if it's not 100%, then that they're not doing well. Whereas actually, I mean, 70% is a target. It's not meant to be achievable by everybody. And so I think people uh, need to be realistic in terms of, yes, 70% is brilliant. Um, and that's, so we're looking for 70% time in range, but without having a huge burden of hypoglycemia. So we want to keep that as low as possible. Uh, and in the, in the graph on the far left, we ideally want that to be less than 4%. Uh, in those who are older or higher risk of hypoglycemia, then we would look to that being less than 1%. Um, so this is important in terms of just being realistic about what we're trying to achieve. I think sometimes people are really hard on themselves and, and they say, oh, it's not going great. And actually, they're 84% time in range. And you think, well, actually, that's fantastic. So I think it's important that these guidelines are out there so that we know what, what, what is the target and what we um, can be hopefully aiming for. Um, on the right, you'll notice that the target in pregnancy is slightly different in terms of the target range um, and some of the time spent in, in the different areas but we'll go into that on a separate webinar. So handing over to Sarah to cover getting the basics right. Thanks, Charlotte. So um, what's um, really important is um, to, to get the best out of the system, we still have to do the basics right. So in terms of carbohydrate counting, it's still as important to, to um, consider the amount and type of carbohydrate um, that you're having consider how accurate your carb counting is, um, potentially look to, to going for low GI options if um, you're having trouble with, with some peaks. 
Um, auto mode will obviously correct some post meal hyperglycemia, but it won't make up for incorrect um, counting. And we'll, we'll show you some examples of that in a second. Boost is obviously a really useful function. We'll go through a bit more about that as well um, in helping the system to more um, quickly correct um, any uh, post meal highs because of something that maybe has gone wrong. You ate more than you're expecting or counted incorrectly, for example. And in terms of high fat, high protein meals, what we'd normally suggest is um, as a starting point on the system, if you used to do um, a split bolus, kind of a square wave or a dual wave for certain higher fat, higher protein meals, then um, a good tactic with closed loop systems is to start by delivering the same um, percentage up front as you would have given on um, normal pump therapy. So for example, if you used to do a 70-30 split for a pizza, for example, um, use that as the starting point and see how the system um, copes with the remainder of the glucose that gets absorbed um, more slowly um, after, the, after you've consumed the meal and, and go from there really. carbs coming through. So I think it's it's using a, a sensible starting point based on what you had done previously and working from there that works quite nicely with, with high fat, high protein meals. And just a reminder there on the um, on the via the CAMDIAB uh, site under training, there's a, a refresher module for carb counting skills that might be useful for some to, to have a look at. Thanks. Next slide. And just to highlight, really, we're not advocating necessarily a low carb diet at all, but um, this is just quite a nice uh, example of how um, the system will always be able to manage um, glucose levels within target if the carb, carb intake is on the lower side. Um, and it just shows this, this person happened to have um, much less carbs and a quite low GI um, meal in the evening. And you can see how, how well the system has, has managed to control the glucose levels there with very little variability. So um, the, if you're finding that you're having some, some quite big peaks post meal, then some of the things um, we just talked about in terms of accuracy of carb counting, we'll talk about adjusting carb, carb ratios and, and how you might see whether they need to be adjusted um, in, in a second. But, um, but yeah, that, that's um, something that makes a difference. Another thing that's really important, although it sounds really basic, but it's it's so important, is to make sure you're still changing your infusion sets regularly. Um, so every two to three days, um, depending on which type of set you use. And it's particularly important with closed loop systems because of the way the algorithm learns. So this algorithm is predictive and adaptive. So if on a, you know, if you're leaving a set in kind of four or five days and the absorption of the insulin is not so good on the fourth or fifth day, for example, that will affect the algorithm learning. So it's really important to, to be um, accurate with your, with your set changes. Um, and within the um, alerts now on um, the app, Right at the bottom of the alerts, you can see you can set an alert to remind you to change your set um, either after two or three days. So, so make use of that if you know you're not great at remembering. Thanks. Next slide. The other thing is around meal timing. So we've talked about how important it is to count your carbs accurately, but um, bolusing, um, timing of boluses is really important as well. And the ideal um, for any closed loop system would be 10 to 15 minutes before the meal. This slide illustrates really nicely what can happen um, if you tend to bolus late for a meal. Um, effectively, you'll see that the, the glucose starts to rise um, because, because you've had um, some carbohydrate. And then if the bolus is delivered later, the system will have already ramped up to try and deal with the peak from, from the meal that's been eaten. And the bolus on top of that, but late, means that you've almost had kind of a, a, a double amount, really a double dose. And, and the upshot is um, usually um, risking going into, going into a low following. So um, it's really important to try and get that bolus in definitely before a meal and ideally 10 to 15 minutes before, although, you know, clearly life gets in the way, but that would be the, that would be the aim. Okay, I'm gonna, Charlotte's going to talk through hypo and hyper management. 
Thanks, Sarah. So uh, overall, there's some sort of just little tweaks that you can benefit from with closed loop in terms of hypo uh, and hyper management. So what you'll find is because it's a glucose responsive system, sometimes you can get away with using less rapid acting carbohydrates. So perhaps one jelly baby or two jelly babies instead of your usual three or four. And that's because the, the closed loop system will have stopped delivering insulin before your hypo. So so you can really utilize the, the sort of closed loop system to get away with not taking so much. Now, if your hypo would still suggest that you take the standard treatment, but sometimes before you get to hypo, just a small amount of, um, of quick acting carbohydrate can really help prevent um, or treat those very sort of mild 3.9 um, hypos because you've already got the benefit of not having any insulin on board for it for often an hour or so beforehand. Sometimes when it's a very quick drop for whatever reason that might be activity or something, then then that's not appropriate to, to adjust in that way. And what's really key for this is, is reviewing on that horizontal graph what what closed loop has been delivering so I think we tend to focus quite a lot on what the glucose is but to really get the most out of it I think it's worth looking at that graph to see well what's closed loop done and that really influences a lot of the decision making around hypo and hyper management because if you see closed loop totally backed off for the past two hours and you're sitting at 3.9 your arrows level then actually one jelly baby to sort of get you above there is going to be perfectly adequate but to take that decision you really need to see the insulin delivery so I think that we could use that horizontal graph a lot more to help in the decision making. then actually because the algorithm has been learning what's happened previously you might find that you end up with a, a couple of hypo episodes and in that situation it's really reasonable to think about raising the glucose target and um, just for a couple of days just to allow again the algorithm to sort of adjust to, to the new normal for you whether that's on your on your holiday um, or what have you so i think again being aware of what what the algorithm's doing what the closed loop system's capable of and and therefore some of its limitations and sort of really utilizing that um, and preemptively maybe raising your target when you know that your your routine is changing dramatically things like uh, changing time zones as well it can just be another sort of uh, protective factor against against hypos in terms of hyperglycemia, I think particularly when people start out um, on a closed loop system, there's this temptation to sort of be quite aggressive in treating things and doing manual corrections. Um, and we, we pretty much um, advise against doing this to avoid um, what, what you can see on this um, figure here on the bottom right is somebody's given their uh, mealtime bolus, so 5.4 units of insulin, and actually for whatever reason, they've had a bit of a spike afterwards. Instead of allowing the closed loop system to kind of manage this, you can see that they've given a correction, but behind that correction in the faded blue bar, you can see that closed loop has probably given almost exactly the same amount of insulin, and they've ended up having twice as much insulin for that correction, and ended up lower uh, later on in the evening um, going slightly hypo. So you can see really clearly there, again, allowing the closed loop system to manage these sort of um, hyperglycemic excursions. I think if there's a reason that you know it's gone very high, so there's an infusion set change and you know that insulin hasn't gone in, it's very reasonable to do a sort of manual correction. But you can see here the issue with trying to sort of work against the closed loop system. So sometimes a little bit of kind of patience and allow closed loop to do what it's designed to do can, can really help not just with the, the hyperglycemic management, but also preventing those lows afterwards. So hopefully that, that figure um, demonstrates that clearly. And this is what I was just mentioning in terms of actually, it, one of the other benefits with with closed loop is because it will ramp up in response to having a very high insulin if actually your glucose isn't falling despite the closed loop giving a lot of insulin then it should start to sort of trigger alarm bells and say hold on a minute is this insulin actually going in because 
closed loop you can see it at night time sort of between midnight and six is really working hard compared to what's happening in the rest of the time and actually there's no sort of movement on the glucose so really that should be sort of alerting somebody to think is this insulin actually going in whereas you don't really tend to have that luxury in terms of standard pump therapy because you don't have this glucose responsive um, alterations in the infusion set so in theory um, it allows you to detect infusion set issues earlier on because you can see this sort of pattern and again in this situation a correction is is completely appropriate to give manually because you know that that insulin hasn't gone in um, so this just really highlighting the, the importance of um, picking up on infusion set failures if, if the glucose levels don't drop despite this, this increase in closed loop delivery. So moving on to ease off and boost, and I'll hand you back to Sarah. I just thought of a point there, Charlotte. If you just go back to that slide with the set failure, um, one thing that it's worth noting is if you want to give a manual correction, obviously Charlotte's um, gone through um, really nicely why you often don't want to, but if you do want to, um, quite often people think that they need to put in kind of fake carbs or ghost carbs to give that correction. So like, I don't know, this person might have had um, a, 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 an amount of carbs and, and some insulin at just before eight um, on that day. But equally, sometimes we notice when people are high there that big amounts of, of carbs go in with a bolus. Um, because people haven't realized that it's actually perfectly possible to, to dial up a dose without putting any carbs in. Um, and to do that on the bolus calculator page, even if the bolus, um, if, if the insulin is reading zero, zero, you can still press next. And then it takes you to that next um, screen where you can use the barrel roll to dial up that, the dose of whatever you want to give without needing to put fake carbs. Or on that bolus um, screen, you can touch the, you can touch the glucose level um, and confirm it to make it go blue. And then it will add on a correction based on your, um, correction factor in your in your pump at that time so normally it wouldn't be taking that into account it's grayed out but if there's a reason like Charlotte said that you do think you need to give an additional bolus then do it that way rather than entering fake carbs and actually that the second one that you describe is probably more accurate because it uses your sensitivity factor rather than just overriding it maybe but um yeah exactly thank you sorry um, okay, so having a think about the uses of, of ease off and, and boost. So just a reminder, ease off um, substantially reduces basal insulin delivery um, uh, and it raises the glucose target temporarily and um, stops uh, insulin delivery if glucose drops below seven millimoles per litre. So it's really useful. Um, particularly around exercise, but also if there's been a run of um, hypos, for example, or it's, um, there's a, it's something that you know potentially could lead to um, increased in hypoglycemia, for example, on a, on a really hot day. Um, so the, the things to note um, is in the same way as with normal pump therapy, we would, we would advocate um, if, it's, if you're setting um, like reduced temporary basal or normal pump therapy for a period of activity, um, we would encourage you to, to set it to kind of 60 to 90 minutes before that activity started. We would say the same with ease off. So to, to I, ideally um, preempt and start ease off about an hour, hour and a half before the, the activity is planned. Obviously, if it is planned, if it isn't planned or you've forgotten, then sure, um, just, just start it as soon as you remember. To help with that, though, it is possible to preset um, the uh, ease off. Uh, uh, um, so you can, I don't know, in the morning, if you know you're going to be doing a gym class um, after lunch and you always forget to, to put it on at the, the, an hour and a half before, you could preset that to come to come to start ease off an hour and a half before you know your gym class is going to, to start that kind of thing. So that's a really useful function. Next slide. Thank you. What ease off can't do is mitigate um, inaccurate insulin boluses. So you can see this slide um, shows really nicely um, that uh, in that first um, red circle in the middle there, someone's given a big insulin bolus for a meal and the glucose has, has dropped a little bit more aggressively than they were hoping for. So they've stuck ease off on as they've got to, to being at a low level. Actually, again, this is where it's really useful to, to turn the phone on its side or ha and have a look at how much insulin is being delivered, because um, what you can see there is that the minute the bolus has gone in practically, the system has um, 
backed off. It's not delivering any insulin. So putting ease off on when there's no insulin being delivered is not going to make any difference whatsoever. It kind of can't suck the insulin back out. Um, so that, that won't help. And you can see the same thing um, just towards the, the end of the day there, towards midnight, that um, the person's running low and so they've popped ease off on. Um, but that's not going to be making any difference at all because the, the system hasn't delivered any insulin kind of since, you know, just after eight o'clock at night. So it won't mitigate um, problems that are caused in that way by um, the bolus doses being incorrect. Um, also, just to note that if you do look um, at your data on Diacend, which we'd absolutely recommend because you do see the data um, clearly, especially if you're looking particularly for patterns and things, is that um, on, on Diacend, um, boost and ease off show as hard and light exercise, which is an issue that we have with, with Diacend. Obviously, it's a system that uploads many, many different types of insulin pumps and, and glucometers. And so they have kind of certain keywords to try and cover everything. And we know that doesn't really cover our ease off and boost. So just to be aware that if you see the, the red hatched area is, is boost and the yellow is ease off, but it will show as hard and light exercise. And we're hoping that will be changed at some point uh, soon. In terms of boost, it um, can be set in a similar way. So it, it, it increases basal insulin delivery by around 35%. It's not as simple as that because it depends on the, the um, active um, the uh, sort of active insulin time, and the sensitivity at that time of day that the system will have calculated for itself. Um, but you can kind of think of it by a, sort of around 35%. Um, and what's really great about Boost is once um, this, once the glucose levels reach target, even though Boost is remains on, it won't push the glucose. Um, it, it won't keep it, it delivering additional insulin and, and risk pushing the glucose lower than target. And so it can be really useful, kind of premenstrually or with growth hormone pulses in adolescence. Um, or um, if uh, there's a period of a postprandial hyperglycemia, perhaps you haven't got the carbs right um, and you just want to help the system bring, bring the glucose levels down to target quicker. Or also if there's been a period of sort of low grade illness. So you don't require sick day rules. You haven't got ketones, but just maybe, you know, just been running a little bit above target all day, for example. And again, you can preset boost to, to start um in an, a pre-planned way, um, not so useful, I wouldn't say, as, e as, as pre-planning ease off, but it's possible to do that as well if there's a particular reason to. And I think on the next slide, what you can see is this is someone who was running a little bit high before bed and so just thought, you know, I'm just going to leave Boost on for the whole night. And you can see really nicely that although Boost was on, it will have only been boosting um, the insulin delivery while the glucose level was above target. And so you can see um, it's it's completely safe to leave on for a long period of time. It won't it won't overshoot. Uh, next slide. One of the things though that will not work and actually tends to cause far more trouble um, is if people are constantly kind of trying to um, jump in and sort of help the algorithm out almost, but it, it doesn't need helping. So you can see really nicely here, someone has been working far too hard, putting boost on for a bit, putting ease off on for a bit when it's dropping, putting boost on again, ease off on for it. And actually what tends to happen is you, you just tend to get more ups and downs. And especially at the beginning, it's much, um, it's much better if you just leave the system to do its to, to, to work it out and do its job, it doesn't learn while boost is, is running, for example. So if you're constantly having to put boost on for certain times of the day, it, it won't be a, a adapting its learning to that. So um, just, um, just bear that in mind. Um, there's another really nice example, I think, on the next slide where you can see um, that um, it can often give this sort of big dipper effect if you're if you're using boost the knees off and boost the knees off. So you can see during the day there, the glucose was rising, the system's ramped up massively anyway, but boost will have made it give a bit more and then it's plummeted and then it's backed off completely. So it's gone, it's, it's dropped. And actually, even when the system's really not giving any insulin, um, ease off has been put on, which has, has meant that the system's backed off and so hasn't delivered enough as much insulin as it might have otherwise. And the glucose levels have shot up again and you just end up in this kind of roller coaster pattern so usually what we say is um using boost and ease off for um chunks of time for a particular reason is the is the best thing to do but you certainly shouldn't be needing to to use them regularly and sort of daily to to kind of combat ups and downs generally it tends to cause more more trouble if anything yeah, I quite like this, um, this one, sorry, because every time I look at it and I see all the ease off, I think most of the time it's on, it's been put on when closed loop's not giving anything. Exactly. And it's 
it feels like a lot of work, particularly overnight and sort of those late night ones where somebody's getting up to do something. Actually, yeah. I think they could probably benefit from more hours of sleep, hopefully, and just allow closed loop to, to do its job because it's pretty good at doing it. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's the, the idea is to have less work, not more. Fine. So just moving on now to reviewing closed loop data. So I think um, and we've obviously really emphasized the sort of benefits of this uh, data view in Diasend. Um, and what it allows you to, to see is the, the impact of the carbohydrate ratio, the timing of the bolus uh, in relation to sort of uh, postprandial rises, and then also some of these additional features, the ease off and the boost. So I think one of the commonest questions that we get asked by healthcare professionals is how do you know when to adjust the carbohydrate ratio using closed loop? Because there's always this sort of, well, closed loop's doing a bit in the background, which is very different to standard pump therapy where the basal's sort of flat in between times. Um, so what you can see on these um, screenshots from, from Diasend, on the one on the left here, you can see that um, the bolus has been given. And after the bolus, there's this huge sort of several times the size of the bolus has been given over the next couple of hours. So yes, there's a small postprandial peak, but actually the major issue is that because this rise is given after the meal, it's almost the same as giving half the bolus that's needed up front and then half later on. So you end up quite commonly with this postprandial hypoglycemia because it's not quite timed as effectively. So yes, you could argue closed loop has managed it, but nowhere near as effectively as it would have been to have had an accurate carbohydrate bolus um, beforehand. So I think if, I mean, this in a one-off occasion could be, could be many different reasons why that's happened. But I think if you're seeing this trend, particularly every day after the same meal, that's a real indicator to actually be increasing the carbohydrate or strengthening the carbohydrate ratio, um, which sometimes feels a bit non-intuitive if somebody's having hypos afterwards. But actually what you're trying to do is minimize this closed loop sort of bolus that's being given afterwards to try to try and get this a, a reduction in the postprandial hyperglycemia but more importantly the, a reduction in the hypo that happens afterwards and you can see i think this is the following day um in the same in the same person actually again this very similar pattern so actually a few days of that and you start thinking okay breakfast we need to strengthen that ratio um, and again, it's the same rules that we would apply to, to other um, sort of standard pump therapy. Rather than changing a ratio on the basis of just one or two episodes, it's worth just looking for patterns and seeing that persistency uh, and, then, and then changing things at that point. And just important to note, there's the, all the pump settings, so the carbohydrate ratio and things, is all read from the Dana pump. It's not stored in the app. So any adjustments to that need to be made on the Dana pump itself um, rather than within the app. Um, and again, here you can see, okay, so after the bowl is actually closed loop is completely backed off, giving absolutely no insulin. Um, and so again, this, if it's a recurring theme, would suggest that actually probably that carbohydrate ratio needs weakening a little bit um, because it, it's too much um, and ease off, you can't ease off on, on nothing. So ease off isn't going to cut it. So if this is happening all the time, it's certainly worth just adjusting that carbohydrate ratio. So I think it's a slightly different way of looking at things. Um, but actually, it's, it's fairly straightforward when you see these consistent patterns. In terms of the personal glucose target, this is a really um, great feature of this um, app, I think, because it just, I mean, yes, the default target is, is um, 5.8, but actually the idea that that target is suitable for everybody with type 1 diabetes across 24 hours of the day probably isn't the case. So really, it's designed to kind of be utilized to meet the needs of different users. Um, and, and we have um, a study with some uh, pregnant women in it, obviously, and that target's completely inappropriate in that population. So there is the flexibility to sort of adjust this at different times of, of day and night. And you can see on one of the screen grabs there how you set it. So it's a bit like how you'd set basal rates and you just change the target um, in there at different hours of the day. Lots of people tend to put the target up at night. And I think um, it's interesting and whether that's a bit of a hangover from sort of 
pump therapy and worried about hypos overnight what we tend to find is that the glucose variability overnight is much less than during the day there's not meals there's not activity so sometimes it's almost the other way around you can you can get away with reducing the target overnight which closed loop is very good at handling and is less challenging and then ha having perhaps a slightly higher target in the day if you're worried about hypos related to, to exercise um, again, you can raise a target if you're having periods where you've got frequent hypoglycemia. So this is totally customizable to what you would find helpful um, and, and to discuss that with your sort of healthcare provider and they can support with that as well. What I would say is that very small changes in the target aren't going to be that noticeable. So actually, if you want to raise a target because you're having lots of hypos, 6.0 isn't going to be noticeable. You probably want to be pushing that up to maybe seven or so before you're going to see a real difference. Um, probably less so in terms of reducing the target. I would probably come down on that quite gradually just to make sure that you're happy that things are, things are as you are expecting them to be, particularly if that's overnight. But I think, again, this can be really utilized to sort of get the most out of the system. In terms of, um, we've talked a lot about all the things that can be adjusted when um, auto mode or closed loop is in operation. It is important to think about the, the basal rates, particularly in, in certain populations, um, because actually during the sort of sensor warm up or if there's ever a problem with, with auto mode functioning, um, and or you, you leave your phone somewhere, then we, you do need to make sure that the basal rates are sort of uh, appropriate and are adjusted periodically to reflect any changes in your insulin needs. So in general, in pregnancy, we'd say that these should be adjusted every sort of two to four weeks. Um, in children, perhaps every three to six monthly, depending on the age of the children, um, and, and every six to 12 months in adults. And you can get a rough idea of what the total basal dose should be from, from the, from the diet end as well, which can sort of guide you as to whether those are really far from where they should be. Um, but in general, that should be reviewed sort of every, every um, well, according to those suggestions, depending on the population. The other thing we mentioned that the um, the algorithm does depend or calculate quite a lot of things based on weight. So again, this should probably be updated. It um, it will affect things like the the active insulin time and and um, and other parameters of the algorithm. So every six to twelve months, similarly in adults, and perhaps more often in children, adolescents, and pregnant women, where where weight is likely to fluctuate a little bit more. Um, and, and again, with the personal glucose target, we'd just say adjusting that as it's sort of clinically indicated. There's no specific um, time. It's just if you're having periods where you've got lots of hypos or, or periods where you think, Do you know, actually my glucose variability is low um, it's worth adjusting it at that point. So hopefully we've we've gone through all of the a bit of a reminder of the system um, and then covered uh, as Sarah did the most important things in terms of actually this is great technology but it can't get past the importance of the basics and and sort of stress the importance of that. We've talked a little bit about the differences in hypo and hyperglycemic management in terms of using a closed loop system. Uh, Sarah's given you ideas about when to use ease off and boost and we've looked at how to how to look at closed loop data to be able to adjust the the insulin to carbohydrate ratio and and to utilize the personal glucose target to get the most out of things. So before we move on to the next webinars I don't know if there's any questions Candice. So there have been a few questions. If you just flick on to the next webinar, um, we can then just give people a few moments because I'm sure they've been listening very avidly and haven't had time to type in. Just a few moments. So those are the two next webinars coming. Please book them and then flick on to the next slide. We've got a question slide now nicely holding for us there. <laughs> So one of the questions um, that has come through already is around um, if you can't, if your data is not uploading to Diasend, uh, what could be the issues that that's stopping that from happening? Yes, yeah, so the, there's a couple of things that you need to check. First of all, in the share menu of the app, there's the uh, there's a space there to enter your Diasend account details. So you just need to put in your username, which is the email account that your Diasend is set up in, and the password, and link it to to, to in that share menu. 
The second thing to make sure is that the, the phone that the app is on is actually connected to either Wi-Fi or has a SIM card in. If those two are in place, then I don't know any other reason why it shouldn't be uploading. It, it tends to be one of those two reasons. I don't know if there's anything else, Sarah, that you can think of that would be an issue. No, we have had a couple of situations with people accidentally when they've been in there checking those, um, the, the charging only and Wi-Fi only boxes that has caused the problem. So yeah, exactly, double check they're not ticked. Um, but um, what you can do as well is delete the share um, and then re-put it in uh, and that often will, will then work. Thank you very much. Can we just go back a slide? There's been a question, uh, just a, a question to say, leave the dates up for the next webinar so they can see it. So thank you very much. So the next question is about somebody who's been using Boost um, for low grade illness. So been unwell for quite a long time and just been using Boost to, to manage um, glucose levels. Um, and the question is, will the system be thinking that they're more insulin resist or more less insulin sensitive, so more insulin resistant, and tend to maintain higher rates as they get better? Or, how, you know, or should they be worried because they've been giving so much more and now they're getting better and what will happen? No, I mean, I think I'm right in saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, Charlotte, that while Boost is running, the system doesn't learn. So um, that's why it's useful for those periods. It's not, it won't be adapting um, to the higher amounts that have been used um, while Boost was on. Um, so it's absolutely fine to use. It's not going to, not going to cause a problem. And it is pretty adjustable as well. If you find that actually it's giving quite a lot of insulin when you stopped using the boost and it's, it notices that the glucose is coming down, it will adjust and it's constantly recalculating that insulin sensitivity um, all the time behind the scenes. So yes, yeah, Sarah, absolutely that it, once the boost is on, it doesn't affect the learning side of things, but also it, it is pretty adjustable when you're sort of stopped boost and, and people's insulin sensitivity changes um, at different times of day, different times of the month, irrespectively. And that's one of the benefits of having an adaptable algorithm that can accommodate that. Excellent. Thank you. So um, it was a question that some people struggle to give pre-meal boluses because they're not quite sure what they're going to eat. So this is often in children or, or maybe people with a poor appetite. So what strategies would you recommend for people if, if they're not quite sure what they're going to eat? It's, it's always worth trying to get some of the bolus in up front. Um, and, and so usually you'll have, you'll have, even with a child, you'll have a good idea that they're going to potentially eat half, for example. And so I definitely still try and get that half up front. And then I think you, you have to take a decision whether you want to um, just leave the system to deal with whatever else it comes through that you didn't perhaps bolus for or um, you know, potentially help it along its way with boost, for example. Um, I think where you have to be careful is, is like we saw in the example um, on one of the slides where um, the system's ramped up for those for the additional carbs that have maybe been um, eaten but not covered in that initial bolus. And then if you go on to do a correction on top of that, you usually end up with kind of like a, a double dose, if you like, and end up with a low later. So I definitely would advocate getting some in up front and then and, and then utilizing, uh, you know, the system might manage depending how much um, else uh, is, is eaten or, uh, or boost might help. You're never going to be able to keep um, the levels within that target range as well, though, within within target if you're not if you're not bolusing up front. But, you know, it, it is what it is, you know, with them, especially with small children when it's a bit of an unknown and, and you know, better to do it that way than them put in for the whole bolus and and then you know they they don't eat um and then you've got potentially more more trouble on your on your hands so i think that's probably the approach we'd use yeah they also don't tend to tell you when they're about to run around either so the idea of a pre sort of uh, anticipating using ease off i think in the very young children is really challenging as well but yeah as best you can just rolling that into another question um, for fatty meals, would would you do something similar of giving sort of some some now, but anticipating the slower absorption um, and and using sort of boost to to manage that? Yeah, absolutely. So again, if you had a particular strategy with normal pump therapy before using closed loop, then I'd use that as your starting point. 
So um, giving for a percentage of the carbs up front, whatever you might have done before, like 70% up front, for example. And then um, you need to just kind of check out what the system does for you. So quite often it might be, especially if it's a particularly high fat meal, you might find that um, just that 70% up front with the algorithm then uh, gently kind of working on the remainder as it comes through is absolutely fine. It might be that you um, need to, to pop boost on as well to help it out. Um, and you might think, you know, have a look back at the, the sort of rise that you saw from putting that 70% in up front and thinking, do I, is, was 70% up, up front enough? Did, did I actually still peak quite quickly? Should I maybe try 80% up front next time and, and let the algorithm deal with the rest with or without the help of boost? Um, so that works pretty nicely. Thanks. There's a question about um, the app being on iPhone anytime soon. So it's often asked. Um, it's purely for commercial reasons that it's not it's not on um, iOS yet. I think we we would all love it to be that way, but. Um, it adds an enormous cost uh, and so um, although it's part of the long-term plan we we uh, we, are, we aren't in a position to do that just yet but we we hope it will will be there in the future we can't give you a date for it though and then there's an, a question about um, you know if you're having a, a lot of lows and it's not sort of associated to the insulin carb ratio is it worth changing your sensitive defect or basal rates on on the pump or, or doing anything differently? No, so it's definitely not, uh, provided it's happening when you're in closed loop or when auto mode's working, the, the, it doesn't take into consideration the, the basal rate. So there's no point adjusting those. What I would suggest is putting the glucose target up um, just to, to minimize those. But as I say, small increments in the glucose target aren't going to make a difference. So maybe putting up the glucose target to 7.5 or so for, for a couple of days. And because that, as Sarah described in one, then there's swings where it's sort of a bit of a roller coaster because you have a hypo and then the rebound hyper are really exhausting for a sort of everybody concerned so i think just trying to minimize the hypos in itself tends to flatten out that roller coaster so i would probably say if it's happening very frequently just raise the target for a few days let the dust settle and then and then reevaluate after that the, the other thing that's just worth bearing in mind as well, um, it's not so common if people go onto the system straight from a, from another pump and you know for pump therapy what your total daily dose is, you know, you, you can you can tell what it was from the previous pump. Um, but we have had a few situations where people have gone from um, uh, injection therapy straight onto closed loop. And when you initialize the system with the total daily dose, it does use the total daily dose and the weight to, to kind of base how aggressive it will be to start off with. So if that's happening in a situation where you've only just started using the system and you think actually maybe I've got my starting total daily dose wrong or I put it in incorrectly, then you can, it's worth kind of revisiting that and seeing if it needs to be dropped if you think it, it wasn't anywhere near kind of the true total daily dose. Good point, thank you. And then I think a last question that's come through is isn't adjusting targets for periods when hypos regularly occur sort of fudge factor, which will stop the algorithm learning about insulin sensitivity. Shouldn't the system realize periods of regular hypos and just adjust itself? Yeah, so it will do. I guess it's just what your threshold for tolerating a, few, a run of hypos is. And I think in, adjusting the target isn't going to affect the learning of the algorithm in the same way that ease off does so ease off almost sort of sits on top of things and it won't affect it whereas actually all it takes is sort of a, a day or so to realize that actually the algorithm does not need to be giving much insulin at that time and that's irrespective of the target so I think from a safety point of view I'd probably be be um, keener to sort of manage that proactively rather than just letting the hypos continue to happen and you're not advocating adjusting the target permanently it's it's a transient kind of yeah. just to, I mean, for, to ease for some people it might be appropriate that it that is adjusted long term and that's how they find that they get the most out of the system running a slightly different target at a different period of time but it can be utilized for, for sort of a short period and they, i know a lot of people who when they go on holiday will pop the target up for the first sort of few days of the holiday 
just to pre preempt the fact that they might have more hypos at that time. And then when they come back, they would reduce it down potentially. So I think it can be flexible. If you're having to adjust the target sort of every day, you're probably working quite quite hard at it. And, and yeah, you're right, the closed loop will do the learning. But I think, it, especially in the event of frequent hypos, I'd err on the side of caution. Mm, sounds good. I think we've come to the end of the questions. Anybody else um, have any questions? There's lots of positive murmurings and thank yous and things like that um, uh, on the system. Oh, one more come through. Um, do you get to, your patients to test their onset of insulin time? So knowing how long it takes from the point of bolus until when the blood glucose levels start dropping sort of uh, 0.8 to 1 millimoles and if so um, do they test this with different infusion sets as you know infusion sets can can influence things I, I, there's no need i think so we we, we don't um, generally with closed loop systems what you tend to see um, whichever system you look at is people's um, glucose levels tending to be um, in more likely to be in target pre-meal um, and so uh, often uh, just trying to bolus 10 to 15 minutes before eating is is perfectly reasonable um, and there's not too much kind of attention that you need to pay um, otherwise I don't know would you would you say anything different Charlotte? No, I, I mean, I think there's lots of things that you could look at and and sort of try and work out and things. I think a lot of it is you, you can be pragmatic about it and, and try and see how things go with basic sort of uh, standard advice. And then if there's something that I mean, some people are do you have a very quick ac insulin action time, but you soon would see that from looking at the data if you find that you are actually having a drop. Uh, before you eat and most people in that situation do know because they've experienced that before on whatever therapy they were on before and certainly with CGM you can see it so yes these are sort of guidance for the majority of people but there are people out there who have a very quick um, insulin onset time and I think you do have to adjust in that situation but um, it's, it's definitely not the majority. One thing, sorry, I, I, I said um, sets, not site. So is there some site to site variations that you've seen from where the infusion set is placed? Or is it just the usual, if it's a lumpy site, don't use it kind of thing? Yeah, I guess I should have mentioned that actually when we were talking about set changes, you know, it's the same deal. Site rotation is is really important. And um, people, it's, I always find it incredible when you kind of have a look at sites in clinic, people will say, I oh, know my sites are fine. And then actually when you when you actually have a look, they, they really are aren't often so as, as uh, you know if you're putting a set into a, a lumpy site you're not going to get great great insulin absorption and you will have more more problems with variability whatever um you know mode of insulin delivery you're using so that's that's really important um it's the algorithm is not going to be able to to learn you know it doesn't know where you're placing the sets it can't it can't learn from it so rotating sites super important and i saw someone just mentioned as well it looked like there's some little on some of those examples there's little gray bars that look like an extended bolus has been set um just to say all that is is you'll see that on the um on the uh, diasend um uploads if the system has briefly lost connectivity um, from the pump during, you know, just for whatever reason, it's just dropped out um, transiently, it'll end up displaying like it's given an extended bolus because the bolus has just maybe lasted past the um, sort of eight to 12 minutes that it was set for by a couple of minutes. Won't make a big, big difference, but it isn't actually an extended bolus that's been set other than the extended boluses that are set by the system every eight to 12 minutes. It's just because there's been a, a connectivity issue briefly there that it shows as a little gray bar. That's useful. That's useful to know. Um, one last question for the system: um, Does the system pick up on quicker insulin onset times and take that into account? Is that part of the the learning algorithm? Yeah. So, and there there are uh, different uh, the sort of ultra rapid acting insulins out there now, and because it is adaptable and it does adjust and it's constantly adjusting that active insulin time, it can accommodate those as well. So, it's you can use um FIAS for or some of the newer ones early and things in it and you don't need to change any of the sort of settings other than reviewing your carb ratio as you would do normally if you were to change insulin. 
I think the other thing, just going back to what Sarah was saying about the infusion sets, I think one of the things that's really important with closed loop and algorithm driven insulin delivery is it really assumes steady stream of insulin. And I think those sites that are a bit dodgy or things like that actually really, it doesn't, it's, it's not ideal for that because you're sort of basing it on some assumptions that actually the insulin's going in quite steadily. So much as the basics aren't glamorous or exciting or anything, mm -hmm. I think if anything, they're probably slightly more important with closed loop. And we've got this tendency to sort of look over them for the exciting stuff, but they're probably more important if anything with closed loop than, than with other therapies. That's a really, really good point. Excellent. Well, I'm going to say thank you very much to everyone. The recordings of all the webinars are available on the CAM APS training portal. You can access that via the camdiab.com uh, website or directly if you look for the CAM APS FX training uh, portal. So they're all there should you want to watch them again um, or share them with uh, you know, your family and friends or part of your colleagues to uh, just refresh those skills. So thank you very much for everyone's input tonight. It's been a great session and thank you for Sarah and Charlotte for all your pearls of wisdom you've shared. So that's been great. And hopefully we'll see you all for our next webinar in about two weeks time on the 18th of November, where we'll be going through schools training and what's available and you know what do teachers and, and support staff uh, uh, need to know about the system to help support children while they're at school. So we'll look forward to seeing you then. Thank you and have a good night.